Lord, we thank you so much for this new opportunity of uh, Bible study. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and minds. And uh, we will be led by you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, what we've seen is that we have this kind of structure starting in the chapter 12 and ending in chapter 22. And right here in the middle, we have the name change. Abram into Abraham and Sarai into Sarah. Now, on one side and the other of this centerpiece, which is in chapter 17, there are two stories somewhere here about Sodom and Lot. Sodom and Lot. First, some kings get into war with one another. And Lot and his family became praise. War praise. They are taken away. Abraham gathers his people. And he has about 318 soldiers in his household. The Bible says people that were born in his household. So from there you can imagine what kind of a guy this Abraham was. How big his household was. If he had 318, I think that's the number, Yes, 318 trained servants, meaning people that can't really go to army. So he gathers them, goes after those that took Lot and his family, gets them back and all the goods, and then there are some other things happening there. On the other side, the story is different. Again, you have uh, Sodom and you have Lot. And again, Lot is in danger. Lot and his family is in danger. The whole city and the surrounding cities are in danger. And Abraham again steps in and intercedes for them. He cannot do anything directly by like going uh, with his soldiers, but he can negotiate a deal with God himself. All right, so these are the two stories we are looking at. Sodom and Lot before the name change and then Sodom and Lot after the name change. The first thing I would like us to look at is in Genesis chapter 14. So here we are in Genesis 14, and here on the other side we have Genesis 18 and 19. In Genesis chapter 14, welcome everybody, good to have you back. In Genesis chapter 14, we have the story of Abraham going after those that took Lot and his family captive. And then uh, he brings them back. But it's very interesting how the whole story is told. Because if you look in Genesis chapter 14, starting with verse 13, you have three names mentioned there. Mamre, Eshkol, and Aner. So it's like this. M-E-A. If you jump to verse 24, you will see that the same names appear. But there is a significant difference. 
The names are the same, but the order is different. It's A, E, M. And you may think, what's the big deal about that? Well, there is a deal, and you might know by this time, why is it reversed? Exactly. It's a strong indication that you have this structure. That's why you have M E A and then you have A E M, right? Because you want to create that structure. It's an indication that something is brought into your attention there. What is it? So now you can look at uh, your worksheet and uh, I uh, outlined that chiastic structure there. You can see those names, right? I pointed out the reverse order in section A on both sides. Then in section B, you have uh, the king of Sodom highlighted on both sides. You have the goods and the people mentioned in both sections on both sides, right? In section C, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brings bread and wine to Abraham. So the king gives something to Abraham. On the other side, in section C, Abraham gives something to Melchizedek. What is that? Tithe, right? So there is an exchange. One gives, then the other one gives. In section D, you can see how God most high is highlighted on both sides. So right in the middle, in section E, it says, and he blessed him and said. So Melchizedek, the king of Salem, blessed Abraham and said something. Now this is very interesting because we don't know too much about Melchizedek. We don't know what kind of life this guy lived. What we know is that he is both priest of the Most High God and also king of Salem. I'm emphasizing this for the sake of understanding that in the Bible, not everything is focused on Abraham. Yes, Abraham is God's special friend and God has a great plan with Abraham and all the families of the earth will be blessed in Abraham and that's exactly what Melchizedek says that's the blessing that Melchizedek reiterates so imagine Abraham is coming back from war yes Abraham went to war he's coming back from war and I can imagine he had some thoughts, okay, so now we had a resounding success, we took all the goods back, all the people are back, but what next? Because most of the time, when this kind of resounding success happens, then there might be a retaliation. Those kings may come together again and hit back. But God has this servant of his, Melchizedek, that comes out, gives him bread and wine, and blesses or reiterates God's blessings on Abraham. Yes, God had other kings, other people, other servants, just like he has people all over the place today. Maybe not too many, maybe isolated, but God works with people. We don't know too many things about Melchizedek, but he is referenced later on in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. What is interesting here, for the very first time in the Bible, somebody, a faithful servant of the Most High, gives tithe to a priest of the Most High. And please notice, Nobody has to tell Abraham to do that. Abraham does that out of his 
sense of gratitude. And from everything he took back from that uh, war booty, he gives a tithe. And if you read on the story, you will find that he doesn't keep anything for himself. This is a rich guy. If somebody thought being rich is a problem in itself, no. If somebody could afford 318 soldiers, people born in his household to go to war with them and bring Lot and his family back, just imagine the fortune this guy had. The richness, the, the, the wealthiness of this guy. That's not a problem. But he says, nothing for me. Nevertheless, he's not stupid. He says, to my guys, those that fought with me, yes, they deserve their part. I don't need it. I'm rich. But they do need it. When he has that conversation with the king of uh, Sodom. So the point here, I believe, based on the chiastic structure, is Abraham is blessed by God, and God uses different means, people placed in different locations to reiterate that to him. Application for us, sometimes we lose sight of uh, what our mission what our call is, sometimes in the most resounding success that we had. And somebody comes along and tells us, hey, you are blessed. God's blessing is on you. Step forward. Genesis chapter 19, you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another very interesting small chiasm there, verses 12 to 14. A little chiasm that explains why the cities were destroyed. So you can see section A on both sides, section B on both sides. Right in the middle, you have section C. And this is what it says. Because the outcry against them, that is, those cities, has grown great before the face of the Lord. And you may think, okay, so what outcry? Who's crying out against these cities? Huh? Those can be human beings. Because in every context of lawlessness and immorality, there are innocents as well. And... If they treated those people that came to Sodom and had that interaction with Lot at the city gate, and you know how they treated them, how the whole city came out to make fun of them and uh, to even harm them, then you can imagine what kind of environment that was. So in that context, some people were still crying out. Or you can imagine that there is a bigger picture of that reality where not only humans, but even angels or beings beyond the realm of humans cry out against what is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah and some surrounding cities. So the point is, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. That's the reason for destruction. Why is Lot rescued? You know, there is a man in the Bible that knew a lot. You know who that is. That's Abraham. Because Lot was his nephew, and he knew who Lot was. That's exactly why when he hears about the destruction of the city, he intercedes. In the New Testament, later on, Lot is called a righteous man. Although Lot, in his um, immediate interaction with uh, those two messengers and then with the people of the city, 
has some weird reactions. God eventually calls him the righteous, a righteous man. But why was he rescued? You may think uh, there should be something in the text where Lot can claim credit and say, yeah, these cities were destroyed, but I, because I was righteous, because I'm the good guy in the middle of those um, bad uh, rascals, God took me out. But that's not what he says. So look at this chiasm in chapter 19, uh, starting with verse 15 and ending with 23. How do you know that's a chiasm again? Look at how it starts and how it ends. When the morning dawned and then the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. And you have those parallel ideas on one side and the other. But right in the middle, in section F, then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. Can you see the focus? Why was Lot saved? How was Lot saved? Out of mercy. You increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life. So again, that redemptive aspect comes back. And there is something else that I will point out in a minute. We've seen that before when we looked at the story of the flood. You remember how it was emphasized right in the middle of the chiasm of the flood story, how God related to the whole situation there. It says in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and God, God what? God remembered. You remember that word, right? So, and God remembered. And uh, we've seen before that that same expression is found in this story. I want you to be aware of something important here. When we look at these two stories, which are parallel, right? Sodom and Lot, Sodom and Lot. We may easily lose sight of the fact that the story, the whole story, the narrative is not about Lot. The entire story is about Abraham. So in the story of Abraham, we have those sections when uh, Lot are fe is featured. Why is it important? Because it's very interesting to see how Abraham relates to the whole situation. Go to chapter 18, starting with verse 16. 18, verse 16. Look at what the story says. Then the man rose from there. So this happens right after the three messengers, which, by the way, who were the three messengers? We know for sure one of them was the Lord, Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord. Okay? And uh, if you want to see something interesting, look at Chapter 18, right at the beginning, verses 2 and 3. This is what it says. So he lifted his eyes, that's Abraham, and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. How many? So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And uh, when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground and said, what did he say? What? If there were three people there, what would you expect him to say? My lords, plural. Did he say plural? 
No, he says, my Lord. So there are two possibilities here. He either personally knows one of them, and he addresses himself to that specific person, calling him my Lord. Or, there's another possibility, it's this always confusing reality in the Bible when you have one, one God, but then you have three, and then it flips back to one, and you, you say, okay, so, so now is it three or is it one? Well, that's the mystery of uh, the triune or triune God, where he is one and three at the same time. And you may uh, think, okay, so is this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or it's Yahweh, the Lord, and two other messengers? It's a pretty tricky question. You may want to go and uh, investigate further, see what the answer to that is. But back to the story, the part of the story where Abraham intervenes. Okay? Chapter 18, verse 16. Then the man rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, so the Lord here is Yahweh. How do you know? In your text, depending on what translation you have, it's capital Lord. Okay, so it's Yahweh. And the Lord, or Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Same blessing that Melchizedek reiterated in chapter 12. Blessed is Abraham, and in him all the nations and all the families of the earth. And watch now, verse 19. Some translations have missed something there. The NKJ has it right. So I'm using the NKJ. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord, Yahweh again, to do righteousness and justice, to do righteousness and justice, I have to emphasize this because there's a lot of speech today about social justice and some religious people have developed a reaction against that. It's like it was hijacked by the political realm. But in reality, when it comes to Abraham and his mission, how in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed, look what is emphasized. I have known him, says God, in order that. Some translations will simplify it and say, uh, I have known him that he may command. But I checked the Hebrew, and there's an emphasis of causality there. I have known him, God says, I have known Abraham probably in a specific way, so that, or in order that, with a finality, with a purpose, there is something about God knowing Abraham the way he knows Abraham. What is that? Because Abraham, being known by God that certain way, has a mission. What is the mission? that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, keep the way of the Lord. And this concept of command in the Bible, I have to point this out. Command in the Bible doesn't have to do strictly and necessarily with a commander, an army commander that... Uh, imposes some rules, strict rules and regulations, and you have to follow strictly that rule or order of the commandment. That's not the concept. In the Bible, command is always connected to a way. So the commandment has to do with the way. 
Abraham will command his children and his household after him that they keep what? The way. Okay? So Abraham serves as a model, as somebody that gives direction, that shows the way. Show me the way. Right? That's the role of Abraham. To do righteousness and justice. Yes, that's the way of the Lord. That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And then the Lord tells Abraham what he is planning to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham realizes there is a danger there because Lot, the guy he knows well, right? His nephew, the guy that kind of kind of got into some conflict with him at one point because um, he felt strong and uh, he wanted to take advantage of everything he could take advantage of. So he went this way, Abraham went that way. But still, Abraham has never given up on Lot. And now he thinks, okay, I have to say something. I have to do something. Let's see what I can do. And he starts a negotiation process there. You know what the highest number, what his highest number is? 50. Well, 50 out of a city, that's not a big number. But see how he gains courage when uh, Yahweh tells him, yeah, okay, if there are 50, I'm going to spare the whole city. No problem. And he brings it down to what? To 10. And when he reaches 10, he feels good. And he says, okay, okay, I think now they are safe. Because he counted how many people they have in the family. It's him, his wife, his daughters, and uh, the married daughters. So yeah, they all together as a family, they are about 10. Unfortunately, you know that in the end, there are less than 10 that, are, that are brought out or pushed out. Hey, go, 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 go out. And even from those that are taken out, one turns back. And you know what happened with Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife, says Jesus later. And then you know how righteous those that made it to Zoar really were. Like his daughters that uh, made uh, their father drunk and slept with him. So they can have... Uh, Offsprings, okay, pretty, pretty fishy, right? Righteous, Lot the righteous. There must be something about righteousness that we miss sometimes. But back to Abraham again. Look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 27. So the city is destroyed. How is the city destroyed? Verse 24 says, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So the Lord brought it from the Lord. I'm just throwing this out there because there is this concept that the Lord would not do anything harmful or perceived as harmful. In the text, you cannot avoid recognizing that it was the Lord that did and brought it from the Lord. But look at verses 27 uh, to, uh, through 29. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. The city is destroyed, and now it comes back to Abraham. It's like you have uh, the camera brought back to Abraham. So Abraham... Early in the morning went to the place where he stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke 
of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered, you remember now, right? The same reality like in the case of uh, the flood. And God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. If I'm getting it right, Lot was not rescued because he was righteous. Lot was rescued, why? Because God remembered whom? So do you now understand what your role, what my role is in our cities? That we may be instrumentalities of God rescuing Lot? from Sodom? Yes, later on, most likely, Lot developed that righteousness connection with God, or he was on the way already. But textually, it seems that God did not rescue Lot because of his own righteousness. But it's, it's the intercession, is the intervention that Abraham brings to the Lord on behalf of Lot and his family. And to me that is wonderful because that's Jesus Christ prefigured, reflected ahead of time the way he came in our history to our world and we are not rescued because of our own righteousness but because of his righteousness. Amen? Your turn. Questions? Very, very deep and good question, yeah? I mentioned it earlier that Lot does things that are very weird. And the question is, how can you reconcile his, uh, his sick idea when, when the whole city is there and they want to abuse those newcomers, those that entered Lot's house. And Lot says, leave them alone. I have two daughters, both of them virgins. I'm going to throw them out. I'm exaggerating the language a little bit. But hey, do as you please with them. Huh? Are you all right, Lot? It's obvious that judging Lot from uh, the perspective of uh, 21st century standards, spiritual ch standards that are Christ-like standards, biblical standards as to what it means to be a good parent, how to protect your family, exposing them that way is highly problematic. Unless you can see in Lot's attitude a glimpse of what God the Father did with his son when he said, instead of destroying these, I'm going to give you my own. Just putting it out there, process it. Okay? So you have... Uh, Abraham and his attitude towards some strangers. Three of them. And then uh, he addresses one of them specifically. And you have the contrast with this city, Sodom, where two strangers, same, two of the same people out of the three that were visiting with Abraham, they are there enter the city, they meet Lot at the gates. Lot, so here you, you again, you can see something uh, very positive in Lot's attitude, right? It's something that reminds you of Abraham, his spiritual father, because Lot is like his son. Lot obviously resembles Abraham in the fact that he says, hey, come on, come on in. Don't stay outside here. It's dangerous. You can't sleep in the marketplace. 
you have to come in and uh, I'm gonna take care of you. You can wash your feet and uh, relax a little bit and then in the morning you can continue your journey. How can you see that contrast? Well, it's obvious that you have two opposite realities there. And uh, what I really appreciate about pointing out this contrast is the attitude toward a stranger. We live in a world where people have to live in foreign places and have to leave their places right now. We have millions of refugees flooding toward Western Europe from Ukraine. And uh, it's impressive to see differences in attitude. You have those that welcome them and help them uh, readily. And then you have those that fill uh, social media with all kind of nonsense talk and uh, criticizing those that do the right thing. I believe in the Bible it's pretty obvious from one end to the other that the attitude toward a stranger is a high standard of uh, somebody that really is a godly person. Not to miss the point that uh, the Apostle Paul says later, be hospitable or practice hospitality because without knowing some people have uh, been hospitable or have welcomed in their houses angels. Now angels, strictly, linguistically, is messengers. Messengers that can be even from outside the realm of human messengers. Thank you. Very good question. So when uh, the Bible says God remembered, is it that he forgot for a while and then out of a sudden he comes out of his amnesia and says, <gasps> Noah, bro, let me do something for him. Or he, he's doing what he's doing uh, there around uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and um, he brings some fire and brimstone down and <gasps> out of a sudden he remembers, oh my goodness, Abraham, my servant. Is that the picture? Or it's rather a way of expressing that throughout all that, God was involved and God intervened and God uh, took the risk, if you want, and uh, has been there for Noah and for Abraham and for Lot. But at one point in the story, in the narrative, the writers want to make it vivid for you that while all this is happening, God remembers. Let me give you a picture. In the book of Numbers, you have the trumpets. The trumpets, when they are blasted, when they are blown and make that sound, it says, God remembers. So the, they, they blow the trumpets and God remembers. So is it that God... Um, other than when they blow the trumpets uh, is uh, with his back to the people and uh, when uh, they blow the trumpet then he turns uh, his face upon them? That's not the picture. The idea is that there is communication and collaboration between humans and God. When God calls Noah for a specific job and uh, in the case of um, Abraham, when God says, I'm going to make you a big nation, in you all the nations will be blessed. Or I know Abraham in order that. There's a specific purpose in that. When God does that, it means that God is involved. But at the level of narrative, of telling the story, when you read the story of the flood, at one point, 
you may think God has abandoned this whole scenario. Yeah, he spoke with uh, Noah in chapter 6, but then in chapter 7, the waters have started from above and from below, and it's gone. God is not even in the picture. And then the narrative wakes you up and says, oh, no, 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 no. God remembers. God remembers. When we remember the Sabbath day, these days, say, when uh, Friday afternoon, like around 5 o'clock, hits, do we <gasps> wake up like that and say, oh my goodness, let's remember the Sabbath. No. But in a sense, we are remembering the Sabbath every single week, right? In the case of uh, Abraham. Abraham has that conversation with God in chapter 18. And in chapter 18, Abraham negotiates the numbers all the way down to 10. And then the destruction starts. Bad things start happening. And you may easily lose sight of Abraham in the picture and have the impression everything is now about Lot. But no, the narrative brings it back to you and says, hey, 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 hey. And God remembered Abraham, because he was the one that negotiated a deal there with God. And the Bible, I mentioned that in a previous um, lesson, the way those two stories, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, are related, are connected through the language God remembered, will project again forward to when Jesus says, and uh, the coming of the Son of uh, God will be like in the days of Noah or like in the days of Lot. Right. Good question. <laughs> Pastor, where do you take those chiastic structures? Okay, let me, let me uh, give you a plain answer. I'm not creating them. They are there. I just recognize them. How do I know they are there? Because this is the Hebraic way of creating a narrative. In the Greek way of uh, telling a story, we go from A to B to C. Introduction, main body or development of action, whatever, and conclusion. And that's where we stop. When you went to school, or if you are in school, that's how they teach you. There is a, an object called research method. They will never teach you go from A to B to C and then go backwards to B to A. But this is the way the Hebrew mind was trained. And the Bible was given in a cultural setting in which those that wrote the Bible, both in the Old Testament and partially in the New Testament, because in the New Testament, for instance, Luke is not necessarily a Jew or Jewish mind like some other guys that wrote the New Testament. And yet even Luke uses it. For instance, in chapter 2, when you read that very short story of uh, Jesus' childhood, when he was taken to the temple and then he's left forgotten there by his parents. If you look how it's constructed, it's obviously that you have a way up to Jerusalem and then a, a way down from Jerusalem. I spoke about this earlier. Please look at your worksheet. Uh, chapter 14, the, the first chiasm that I'm highlighting in your worksheet. The one that has uh, as focal point, and he, that is Melchizedek, blessed him and said, blessed Abraham, okay? Look at the names right at the beginning in verse 13. You have Memre, Eshkol, and Aner. Have you noticed that? Memre, Eshkol, and Aner. If you go to verse 24, you have Aner, Eshkol, and Memre. 
Same names, but there's a radical difference. What is the difference? The order. Why is the order different? Simple, because it indicates to you that you have a chiastic structure there. Because you have M, E, A, and on the other side you have A, E, M. I uh, said this before that uh, in a chiastic structure you have some indicators. One is movement. For instance, Abraham goes to war, Abraham comes from war. Right? So you have that parallel structure. You have names that may be laid out in a different order, reverse order. You have the same, for instance, in um, Genesis chapter 10. You have Shem, Ham, and Japheth in verse 1. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then when it's described who gave birth to whom, it's Japheth, Ham, Shem. Is the reverse order. Why? Because that's a chiastic structure. So how do I discover them? Some of them I can see because now I have a trained eye for that. So after a while, if you get used to, and that's exactly what I want to accomplish here. I know much of the information goes. But if you develop a way of looking at scriptures, that can help you immensely. Because after a while you have trained eyes and when you look at a story, you look for names, for movements, for giving or receiving, things that are in mirror and things that are parallel. And when you see a story, a beautiful story, you always want to ask the question, okay, a story is amazing, but what does it say? Because depending on how a story is told, it can point in different directions. It's like an illustration in a sermon. You may listen at a sermon illustration when somebody is preaching and you think, oh, I know this illustration. Yeah, but you never know where it's going to take you now, depending on the context, right? So some of them I can see. When I do my study, I do the Hebrew reading. And it's amazing because, because there you can see exactly the words. Sometimes, for instance, look at uh, Genesis 19, verses 15 and 23. It's the, the last chiasm here. It says, when the morning dawned, that's how uh, the NKJ says it, then the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. In the, the English language, you may think, well, it's not the same exact language. The idea is the same. Yeah, but in the Hebrew, it's the same language. So I go to the Hebrew language. Plus, if you are interested, there is a very good uh, Bible study site. It's called Chiasm Exchange. Chiasm Exchange. And you have tons of chiasm. Some are very tentative. You may think, ah, that's not really a chiasm, but some are obvious, like daylight, that it is created in a specific way. So I want to encourage you to develop that way of reading the Bible when you are analytical. A strong pointer is this. When you read a story and you have a linear mind, because that's how they train us in school, ABC, you read a story, and at one point you have the impression the story has thrown you back. You can bet it's a chiasm. Okay? So you, you are going like this. Okay, the flow of the story takes me in this direction. All right. And all of a sudden you have the impression it's speaking from the past. Yeah, it took you back because that's how it works. Up and back down. All right, thank you. You've touched something extremely interesting. Never thought about it like this, but now I, I, I can see it. 
So yes, there is a certain structure because it helps with memorization. Remember, the Hebrew culture to this day is a culture where the rabbi has to memorize the Old Testament. It's very hard to memorize when you don't have solid pointers. When you have some, some handles to grip, it's much easier because you know you're going this way and then you're going backwards. I uh, experienced that back in the day. I was still in college studying uh, for pastoral ministry. And uh, one of our uh, professors said, hey guys, I'm going to give you uh, an A if instead of uh, learning the material, the course, the class material, you will uh, learn the book of uh, songs, the song of songs by heart, being able to say it from the beginning to the end without any mistake. And uh, because uh, you have to be a little crazy to be normal, I said, okay, I'm going to take it. And I'm telling you, it's not easy, especially when you have descriptions of him or her. If you do not see structure there, you're lost because your brain needs some solid grips. But I was able to learn it, thank God, because I developed a, a way of looking at the whole book and how things follow one after the other. And... and when I would uh, tell him the whole book, because yes, he had the patience to listen, <laughs> I, I would just go through it visualizing. Uh, and uh, needless to say that every people has different elements in the way they tell a story. For instance, a Germanic way of telling the story is uh, thesis, Antithesis and then synthesis or synthesis, right? That's the Germanic way of telling a story. So you have a thesis, you attack that thesis, demolish it, or bring all your arguments against it, and then you bring them together and you make a synthesis. That's the Germanic. Have you ever read a French novel? A French novel? It drives you crazy. A French novel will start here and go all the way all over the place and winding back and forth. And by the time you end, you say, oh, wow, where have we been? But that's the way they create it. Or for, for those that come from the Asian cultures, I'm going to overgeneralize a little bit, but this is the way an Asian can tell you a story. He wants to point to this, this dot here. But he or she goes all around, all around, all around, all around, never hit it, but expect you to get it. Why? Because that's the culture. They will never come to you and say, hey, Brian, boof. No. They will take you one more round. Didn't get it? Okay, let me take you one more round. Didn't get it? One more round. Or the Bantu, the African way of telling a story. It's like a flower. You, you have a, a, a petal. Somebody puts another petal on it. Somebody brings another petal. And another petal. And by the end of the day, you have such a great conversation. What was it about? Well, I don't know many things, but it was so good. <laughs> and you think that's wrong? No, it's not wrong. It can be extremely fulfilling. So the point is every culture has specific ways of saying something. I was expecting to get some uh, questions about war, because Abraham went to war, but it's 10.30 next time. Okay, thank you so much. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for the beauty of it, for how you are giving us your way of looking at reality. 
and we pray that you will deepen our understanding in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen.